Hello and welcome to Walk the Walk. I am Roy Counts and I am at the Paramiku Lakeside on a very windy day. And with me today, I have Leighton Baker. Welcome to the show, Leighton. Thanks so much, Roy, for having us here. Leighton is the leader of the New Conservatives. And as recent polls have shown, Leighton, you really have a pathway to Parliament this time around. This will be your first time in Parliament. It would be, yeah. absolutely. For all of us. Yeah. So no one on our team is a politician. Yeah. Uh, but, but 70% of us are just small business owners. Yeah. And the only reason we're really involved in politics is because we, we're looking at the trajectory where New Zealand's going. We think, hold on, we're losing our freedoms, right. losing our rights, businesses are being destroyed, you know, people are losing hope, and we're thinking, someone's got to do something. Right. And and so we guess, well, if no one else will, we'll have to have a crack. There was a feeling, uh, you know, maybe uh, 10 years ago, 9 years ago, when the party was formed, that um, it's a party of white um, you know, middle class farmers, uh, Christians, Bible thumpers. But your not only your forward pack, but your entire list does not look anything like that. No, I mean that's perception, isn't it? People yeah. like to paint a picture and say yeah. you fit in this group, right. which is just not true. I mean, we are the only party yeah. in New Zealand that wants binding citizens in the Tiaisha referenda. Right. So we're the only party saying we will not take control. Yeah. Everyone else says, oh, a vote for us will do this and that, but actually. Once you get them controlled, they will do whatever they want and they will not hand the reins over. We're the only party saying we are willing to give the people of New Zealand the right to control the government between elections. Have you fielded uh, candidates in the Maori electorates also? Yep, we've got every, every electorate in New Zealand first. So, including the seven Maori uh, Including electorates. the seven Maori. Wow. We've got some lovely guys there. Yeah. Uh, really, really mm. nice guys. And some of them haven't had perfect lives. Yeah. But they're keen, they're passionate, and, and they love their families, right. and they just want good for New Zealand. Right. So, you have in your top uh, ten, you have... Uh, Someone who is a Maori, you have someone who, a couple of islanders, I think. Yeah. You have a Indian, yeah. and then you have, a, you know, a, I think also, you have a Singaporean Chinese in Victoria O'Brien, yeah. and I think a couple of other Asians. Yeah. So you actually have a mixed, uh, you know, uh, representation. Yeah, and, which is a bit uh, funny because we never set out, yeah. like, we don't pick our top 10 based on the color of their skin exactly. or the gender. Totally on merit. We, yeah, and we listed what right. do we want. Yeah. And what skills everyone's got. Right. And that's how we made the list. And Absolutely. then it went from the original committee to a second group right. and who are totally independent of the party. And their job was simply to look at what skills people had and slot them in. And that's how we come up with the list. And it, like you say, it's, it's yeah. really representative. Absolutely. And and uh, the reason I, I mentioned the diversity is because, uh, you know, to break that uh, mold of what uh, the New Conservatives being a white, far right party. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, when you have that kind of diversity, uh, yeah. I don't know where that perception comes from. Where do you think it comes from? Oh, it's just people trying to sell print. <laughs> you know, it makes it, it makes a story. Like, you know, I, I'd accuse my media of being far right. Yeah, I said, yeah. oh, for crying out loud, like, yeah. I'm a businessman. I work. I pay my tax. I obey the law. Yeah. I would raise my family. I treat everyone fairly. Right. You know, what is it right about? The right extremes about? I mean, they've called they've called um, some of our candidates who are very much not white. Yeah. white racists. Because wow. they haven't seen them. They say, oh, you're part of that party, you're white extremists. Yeah. And they go, you know, I'm Indian. How can I be a white supremacist or I'm a Pacifica? Exactly. And, and so they're just using the terminology to yeah. demonise yeah. a group, us as a side. But it's simply not true. We're just representative of New Zealand. They've tried to re re redefine what racist means. That's yeah. the funny thing. Yeah. So, you know, to me personally, racist meant you treated people differently simply yeah. because of the colour yeah. of their skin. Yeah. But no, for some, it's got some other strange meaning now that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But the reality is people have always labelled someone yeah. to try and treat them differently. Right. If you look at the abortion issue, mm. if you want it, you keep calling it a baby. Yeah. I say, what's the difference between a baby and a fetus? Right. It's love. Mm. If you want it, it's a baby. Yeah. If you don't want it, you call it a group of cells or a fetus because right. then you can exterminate it. Yeah. So And, and it's the same, with, well, the same with what happened in, in Germany. You know, right. They start calling people different names. names yeah. Then you can treat them in human. And that's, that's what happens. Happened in, in America, yeah. you know, with the slavery, they called them a different name, and it wasn't until someone said, "Hold on, these are human beings. Right. They have a different colour skin. Right. You can't treat them differently." Right. But uh, people want to label you so that yeah. they can treat you yeah. in a different way. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about your policies and you know what you stand for. But let's begin with you, uh, Leighton. You, yeah. uh, you know, you, you actually came in from left field. You are not a career politician. You know, uh, maybe six months back. Not many people, you know, outside of new, uh, new conservative circles knew about you. Uh, over, the, over the last few months, you have been quite visible. You're on TV, you have been on social media. So people know a little, you know, about you. Tell us uh, who is Leighton Baker. You know, I've seen some, you know, uh, information about you that you have lived all across New Zealand. You're from the far north to Invercargill. Tell us about it. 
Yeah, well, well, my family shifted quite a bit when I was young. So I was actually born in Lower Hutt, mm -hmm. so just out of Wellington. Yeah. Then we moved to Masterton, which is about an hour north of Wellington. Mm. Then we moved down to Macargill, which is quite a long way from Wellington. <laughs> and we were there for a couple of years. My dad was working at the smelter as yeah. an accountant. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, we moved. I started school in Macargill, eh? yeah. and then we moved to Rotorua. Yeah. I did all my primary schooling in Rotorua. Yeah. Uh, and then from there, we moved up to Auckland. Mm. And I did my secondary school in there. I went to St. Kennedy College in Auckland. I uh, did my secondary schooling. Mm. And then when I left school, I went up the far north and worked on a, a stud Romney farm. Okay. And I'd done work there in the holidays, okay. so mm. uh, I got to know the guy, and then yeah. when I had enough of school... Yeah. Uh, this is interesting, though, actually, what happened is uh, my mum and dad split up. Mm -hmm. And so when they split up, I sort of made some poor choices. Yeah. And looking back at it now, I can see the, it's the effect of them. Now, they didn't... It wasn't acrimony, so they weren't hating each other, yeah, beating each other yeah, up. Yeah. They just parted company. Mm. But still, I could see, looking backwards, how it affected me, and so... And I'd always been a really good student and, and achieved well and I started dropping the ball and not going to school and all the rest of it. So I, I left and I went and worked on this farm right. out the far north, which is great. In fact, I revisited it just this weekend. <laughs> it was fantastic. Yeah. So, and then from there, I moved back to Auckland. I mm. did my carpentry apprenticeship mm. and then I got married to my lovely wife. Mm. And, uh, we had a couple of children in Auckland yeah. and decided I, I need some cheap babysitters. So we shifted <laughs> down to the South Island where she was from. Yeah. We've been there for 30 years. Mm. Um, I was on the west coast and I said to someone, I said to a guy, I said, how do you know when you're actually a west coaster? Mm. And he said to me, when the last person that remembers you shifting here has died. <laughs> <laughs> Probably similar to Canterbury, we've only been there 30 years yes. so we're not a local yet. Uh, and, we're, and we're still down there, I really yeah. enjoy it. we've had a pretty good run down there. Mm. Um, it's just a bit quieter, but slower yeah. pace of life. Yeah. Kids had a pretty good. So we got four children now and, and five grandchildren. Which... Wow. What is your policy on uh, you know the government stepping into uh, actually into the housing market? Are you for it or are you? Well, you, you don't, the government shouldn't actually do stuff like that. Mm. It's not. They're terrible at it. I mean, we've we've evidenced it. Yeah, we said a hundred thousand. What do we get a thousand? They, yeah. they can't build houses. Mm. It's not their job. And right. the ones that have built have cost an absolute fortune. Right. Because they interfere. Right. So they shouldn't interfere. Government should actually just support people that are doing it. Right. Rather than jump on themselves. And that's across the board. You see, we met a guy recently, and uh, he's known as New Zealand's most efficient houses of the poor because he's passionate about it. He's got a vision. He knows what he wants to do. Yeah. But. The government come along and, and they went, oh, you need to fill these forms and do that. And he's going, no, get stuffed. This is what I'm doing. Mm. You either get behind me and support me or rack off. But yeah. this is what I'm doing. And he's really good at it. So government's role should be support people who are already doing stuff, right. make it easier for them, right. help them overcome the hurdles they've got, because then you're more efficient. But as soon as they start to build a new structure, yep. yeah. It's really inefficient because yeah. they spend all this money building a structure, yeah. but not actually getting onto the front line and doing the work. Right. So, um, your government should, what government could do, in fact, for housing is, is start a joint ownership model. Mm -hmm. Where, mm -hmm. so for instance, you you needed a house, yeah. uh, you couldn't afford the six hundred thousand mortgage. They yeah. said, well, we'll put two hundred thousand mortgage in. You put the four hundred thousand in. Yeah. You pay us off, yeah. and when you paid us off, the whole lot becomes yours. Right. But that, what that does is gives you home ownership. Right. It gives you security, it gives yeah. you family security, yeah. your kids will go to the same school, it's better for your health, your wealth, your mental well-being. Right. That would be a much better use of funds than exactly. the government trying to, I don't know how many billions they've spent for the few houses they've built. Yeah. It'd be scary to find out. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, let's talk about uh, your other policy, the, uh, the environment and the farm policy. Yeah. Uh, you have actually made some really strong statements on uh, the way uh, the current uh, the government is handling the environment issue. For example, yeah. let's talk about 1080. Yeah. Now, you have some pretty out-of-the-box ideas for 1080. Tell us about it. Well, I don't really think it's out-of-the-box. I think mm. it's just a wee bit of common sense. Like, mm. You know, you have two distinct groups of people. Mm. Some that love 1080, so it's the only way to control the pests and the predators. Yeah. And without it, we lose our native species. Right. And then you have others that say it's a terrible mil million poison should never be used. Right. But the real question I think people are asking is how do we control the pests and predators to retain our native species? That's mm. the question you're answering. Mm. asking. This group is saying 1080, this group is saying no. We say, well, try alternatives. That's yeah. all we're saying. Yeah. So if we use trapping and luring mm. more, so mm. we do use it a bit here, yeah. but I've had trappers say to me, Leighton, if you gave us a 10-year contract, mm. we could control areas uh, cheaper, more efficiently than 1080. Right. Now, I don't know if that's true, yeah. but we're saying give them a chance, chance because yeah. the benefits of that yeah. is you can use the fur. Mm. I think possum fur and polar bear fur are the only hollow fibers, so mm -hmm. waterproof fibers. Yeah. And then you can use the meat for pet food. Yeah. You've got an industry of work and employment, right. building traps, maintaining traps, setting traps, retrieving, and all of that sort of right. thing. Yeah. And, and so 
we, we're saying replace 1080 where possible. Now, right. the reality is, from a lot of people I speak to, is you're not going to be able to get rid of 1080 from throughout New Zealand. Right. Not in the immediate future, because right. there's some areas you just cannot get to. Right. And obviously, we don't have enough skilled trappers yet. Right. But actually start down that process. Right. Actually give them a shot at it. And it may, maybe we reduce our usage by 50%, maybe 80%. We don't know. But until we try, we won't find out. They could have used a provincial growth fund for that, couldn't they? I mean, train trappers and all of that. Well, you just need to empower people first. Mm -hmm. So you need to find those few that can do it now and right. give them an area for right. a 10-year contract. Right. Let them prove it works. Yeah. And if you're proving it works, then you just keep extending it. Because we do want to look after our native species. Right. Tell us about the new winter grazing rules which uh, <laughs> came in you know, on the 1st of September. Okay. Uh, uh, I find it completely ridiculous that they are saying that the land should be... You, know, you can't graze them in winter if it has got a more than 10 degree you know, slope. Tell us about it. You can look at, you know, all of New Zealand is like this. Well, that, that just, this is almost a 45 degree slope, you know, where we are standing. <laughs> well, the, what you have is um, winter grazing, people need to understand, is mm. when you part, plant a really intensive crop. Yeah. And, you, and, and you're virtually sacrificing those paddocks. You yeah. know they're going to get destroyed. Right. But you're sacrificing them to save the rest of your farm. Right. Because in winter, the ground gets soft. Right. You don't want to destroy it with cattle, heavy cattle moving over. Right. So you plant an intensive crop and then yeah. you strip feed it, which means every day you shift the electric fence a wee bit and the, and the stop, whether yeah. the cows are sheep, yeah. they get a bulk deer, they get a bit more of that high nutrient feed every single right. day. Right. But obviously, because they're only standing on a fresh bit of dirt every day, the, the ground they've already stood on yeah. gets destroyed. That's right. The winter grazing rules say you are not allowed more than 50% of your paddock covered in hoof prints. So where that would work is you could graze half the paddock yeah. and have half the paddock not grazed, but then you can't go more than half a paddock. So right. What have you done with the rest? Yeah. And then they may say, well, because you've only grazed half, we're concerned that a whole paddock. Yeah. Could cows leave hoof prints. So what the, the, the effect of these rules, and we won't go into all the details, yeah, but the yeah. effect of these rules is you cannot do winter grazing like we have done in the South Island. Just walk, it's impossible legally to do it. Really. Right. Unless you build a massive feedlot with concrete and sheds and um, uh, yeah, and uh, sort of get them to feed indoors. Sort yeah, of, yeah, sort which, of, yeah, yeah, which we, we sell our meat. Yeah, we yeah. sell our meat as free range. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to change the way we market. Right. But uh, interesting survey came out the other day. They're asking farmers, what are the things that are causing you the most stress? Mm. Now, five percent of them said the missus. <laughs> <laughs> which that's pretty good. It was only five percent. Um, but 75% said it was government regulation that was causing them stress. But 75% of farmers. 75% of respondents said it was government regulation causing them the stress. And now, so, so they have mental health issues because of that? Because, because of thinking, of oh my God, okay. Well, what the government do not understand, well, I don't think they grasp mm. the fact that farmers bring in about 30% yeah. of our income, 30%. Yeah. Yeah. And so we shouldn't be hampering them, we yeah. should be helping them and assisting them. And, and that's research and development to overcome the issues they right, have. Right. But farmers are working really hard in New Zealand to, to improve water quality. Right. Like, I think they've planted, put in something like 30,000 kilometres of fencing, right. planted like 6 million native plants. Mm. So just this weekend, I went to two or oh, two different places yeah. where they've done just that. The, one of them had fenced off a bit of bush and a paddock, and I, this was a farm I used to work on, actually. Okay. So 30 years ago, it was just a few native trees sticking mm. out of a paddock. Mm. Now, it's fenced off, put in the Queen's chain. Mm. It is a native bit of bush. There's wood pigeons going through. It is gorgeous. Right. He paid for it. Okay. He fenced it off. Mm. He put in the Queen's chain. He's protected it off his own back. Right. And another guy's just fenced off 40 acres, mm. no, 40 hectares mm. of wetland. 40, 40 hectares. hectares. Oh, okay. And he's planted 15,000 native plants. Wow. Paid for by him. Mm. So people need to recognise our farmers love the land. Right. They want what's best for it. Right. Most of them are doing the right thing. Yeah, and I, this is what I don't understand that, uh, you know, the New Zealand farmers, they actually, in the OECD, from what I know, mm. they have the lowest emission. Yeah. And, you know, they are very sustainable, yeah. but they're always demonized, you know, and I think it has come to a stage where young people even, you know, don't want to go into farming because, it, you know, the left has demonized them such a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, we went to the Northland field days and uh, farmers were coming in mm. and we chatted to them and they were embarrassed to say they were farmers because yeah. they felt they felt like they were some sort of criminal yeah. by what the media saying. Right. Hold on, mate, you, you supply food. Yeah. Do you like eating? I love eating. Absolutely. So they're providing an essential, and yeah. yet we're treating them like we're like criminals. Yeah. No way. So we're saying actually flip it on its head, reward them, respect them, empower them, spend some money in research and development to overcome the issues they're facing, right. but actually recognise the value they bring to New Zealand. In fact, COVID recovery, you know, while we were all locked up sitting in our homes, the farmers were still farming. Right. They were still bringing an in income. Right. You know, and Absolutely. where's the yeah. recognition of that? Yeah. And and what do you, you know say about the bureaucrats? You know, who probably have never been on a farm, and then they make all these rules about you know don't 
degrees, you know, if the land is more than 10 degrees. Where do they get these figures from? Well, where no, do they get the 10 degrees from? Well, no, I, th I think what it is, it's an ideology. Mm. And so it's an ideology and they're not looking at the whole picture, but yeah. that's across the board. Yeah. So I guess it's one thing I love about our team is that they're experienced. Like our, yeah. our farming spokesman has been a farmer. He's owned a farm, you know, right. he works with farms now. Right. So it's uh, uh, Victoria O'Brien yeah. is on our top team. And yeah. she's got a farm, right. she's working stock. We yeah. bring her sometimes at night to have a meeting and she yeah. says, I'm sorry, I've been doing carving all day, I've got to go to bed. You know, so they're real people that yeah. understand it. And so the policies we write are written looking at both sides, you know, what is good for New Zealand, but also how do we keep employment going? How do we keep income coming in? Right. How do we make it fair for New Zealanders? Right. Because at the end of the day, you should be rewarded for effort. Right. Because if you're not rewarded for effort, why put in effort? Right. Uh, in fact, uh, all these things about, uh, you know, all the high highfalutin ideas of uh, using... Uh, sort of uh, not not using uh, growing pine trees <laughs> on uh, you know arable land yeah. you know uh, where did these ideas come from <laughs> you yeah, it's actually a part of the ideology again yeah. but it, it doesn't actually work so if new zealand went net zero tomorrow net yeah. carbon zero tomorrow yeah be no discernible difference in the world right. no discernible difference in the world environment right so what we're doing is we're hurting our economy yeah. hurting our workers for no discernible good that's right. poor governance yeah and, and what's worse is we're planting these pine trees yeah for carbon credits. Right. But the trouble is, it's only an 18 year plan. Right. Because yeah. they, they don't start really getting going for two or three years, yeah. and then they, they you can't claim credits once you're 18 years old. Right. So at 18 years old, you've either got to chop them down, mm. but if you harvest them, you've got mm. to pay back the carbon Can't, credits. That's right. So you, if you do chop them down, you've got to replant, but when you replant, it's only to compensate for what you've chopped down, so there's no more carbon credits you get. Right. The other thing is, you just leave them and disappear overseas because right. you've got your money off the government right. and let the New Zealand public deal with the issue. Yeah. And I believe that's what's going to happen. Yeah. And so, do you, do you know, like you look at this, see this grass going? Yeah. yeah. When the grass grows, it's absorbing carbon. Yeah. The best place to store carbon is not pine trees, it's yeah. actually the humus in the soil. So, yeah. change the way we farm. Yeah. more humus in the soil, let that store carbon, it stores it in there. Right. Carbon's a closed cycle. Yeah. What The carbon that is in the world is in the world now. That's right. Yeah. It's just whether it's in the ground or in the air yeah. or in the sea, that's yeah. the question. That's right. So if we if we want less in the atmosphere yeah. and more in the ground, just change yeah. the way we farm. But the pine trees is actually a really poor idea because what we're in fact doing, yeah. we, the taxpayers of New Zealand, are paying for foreign companies to come into New Zealand, buy our land, right. and plant trees. Right. That's not good governance. Yeah. In fact, uh, I think you are against the emission uh, trading. Uh, yeah, I, I am because I don't see any benefit yeah. for right. it. So yeah. we're saying instead of spending money, yeah. like I think for next year it'll be two billion dollars or something per annum. Right. Instead of spending in there, yeah. take some of that and spend it in research and development for pollution solutions. We call it. Right. And but I was reading just the other week, uh, these guys invented a filter mm. that goes on a smokestack where you mm. burn coal. Yeah. And you see, I'm burning coal. Yeah. You know, we make our steel burning coal, yeah. dry our milk powder burning coal, burning coal. I think we still heat some schools and hospitals burning coal. So right. if we're going to burn it, these filters go on top and they take the particulates out, and mm. then they turn that into jet fuel. Right. Well, what a great thing. And that, that's actually, that technology was developed here. Yeah. Now it's been used in the States. Right. That's the way we can change the world. Absolutely. Even in Sweden, I think they have a fantastic technology to recycle uh, garbage. You know, they don't have any landfills. Yeah. And, you know, all uh, they have, they've got some technology which uh, sort of converts most of it into, um, I think, manure or something of that sort. Uh, I'm quite amazed that we don't have, uh, you know, that kind of technologies here. In, uh, yeah, yeah, we, well, we keep on talking about, you know, for, for the viewers who may not know, emission trading scheme is like a voucher system. Yeah. You sort of buy vouchers and then, you know, every time you cross your uh, cap, you need to pay it back to the government. You know, you, you, you're basically, yeah. you're paying a fine for generating carbon. carbon yeah. Yeah, that, that's all it is. So, yeah. But yeah, what you're talking about is, is actually waste of energy. Yeah. And we saw one uh, when we were in Italy. Yeah. And I, th I th thought it was a nuclear power plant, being a bit naive. But um, I said, oh, you know, it's a huge smokestack. Well, there's yeah. nothing coming out of it. Yeah. Oh, that's our waste of energy plant. So all the waste goes there, gets incinerated, they turn it into heat and right. they pump the heat into homes. Okay, I so, see. And, and it's all just about, but they have big filters on, so you don't mm. see any coming at the top. So, I see. Um, I know the West Coast were thinking about putting one there and, mm. and shipping New Zealand's waste to it because yeah. we're a small country, we're so spread out. Yeah. They don't know if it's efficient to do it in any one centre. But right. We were going through Dome Valley. They obviously do not want the, the latest landfill in Dome Valley. Right. So a waste energy plant makes sense. Yeah. And if you had it in Auckland and you had barges coming in with the waste from around New Zealand, yeah. 
I think it does make logic sense in some way. Right, because the uh, landfills are not going to work. We know what happened in the West Coast when that storm hit uh, last year. Oh, yeah, think, yeah. yeah it was well, really... it's a short-term solution, yeah, yeah. so we need to think a little bit more long-term. Right, yeah. Yeah. Now, let's talk about some of your other policies which have got a lot of traction. And I think we'll, let's talk about two policies which will get a lot of traction with the uh, Indian and the Pacific uh, you know, communities, which is on euthanasia, which is the uh, end-of-life uh, you know, choice yeah. bill and uh, cannabis right. and of course abortion bill which has already been passed but mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, I think some parties have said that uh, and I think you're one of them which said that you may re repeal that act if you come into come to Yeah power. we said we will repeal it yeah. because a decision like that should not be made by 63 MPs. Right. It should be made by the people of New Zealand through referenda. I don't think uh, people of New Zealand actually know how severe the abortion bill is. I don't no. think you know if, if you were to take a vox pop you know I don't yeah. think people on the street would know about the abortion law, it is so draconian. We just had an interview and this young girl came up and started getting stuck into us about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and said, you know, why are you talking about abortion? You know, should leave it. And I said, well, when is it okay to kill a young New Zealander because they're inconvenient? What yeah. do you mean? I said, well, do you know that it's full version up to full time? I don't yeah. agree with that. Yeah. I said, well, that's, that's, what, yeah. so that's what I'm standing up for. And mm -hmm. you actually agree with me on that. Mm -hmm. um, which I didn't want to say she agreed with me, but, <laughs> but the reality is, yeah. New Zealanders do not understand that we've legalized it. Yeah. to brought up to full term. And, and, and we've actually taken the human rights off a of in society. Yeah. Because Simon O'Connor, the national MP, he put an amendment for that if a baby was born alive during yeah. abortion, yeah. it should get medical treatment. Right. The government voted no. Yeah. So that means a baby that's born alive, so that's a live New Zealander, yeah. has got to be left to die. Yeah. Well, that's taking the human rights off them. Yeah, that's, this is that's terrible. It's terrible. illegal to abort a calf in New Zealand, yeah. but you can abort a baby, it can still be alive, and you're not allowed to give it medical treatment. Yeah. How whack is that? Oh, well, just under doing wants more funding for yeah. stillbirths and yeah. miscarriages. Yeah. Well, you can't say it's okay to kill a baby full term and then yeah. say, oh, we need more help when these babies die before they're full term. Right. It's hypocrisy. So right. when is, I think the big debate for us yeah. as a nation is when does life start? Right. That's important. We need to have that debate. Yeah. You know, is it, is it when brainwaves start, when the heart starts beating, when they can actually survive outside the womb? When is it? Because right. we haven't discussed that. Right. But all we've done now is legalise the killing yeah. of young New Zealanders. Isn't right. it? And that's, I don't think that should be in a caring society. Right. Let's talk about uh, the end of life choice bill, Tunisia. Yeah. Um, you, you are opposed to it. Uh, yep. What are your main grounds for opposing it? Okay, it's so a good law is easy to define and yeah. easy to uphold. Yeah. So our law at the moment is it's illegal to take your own life. Mm. What this bill brings in is a word called unless, mm. basically. Unless you're terminally ill, you're going to die in yeah. three months, as two doctors certify it. Mm. Um, and so what we're saying is that will always be challenged and extended. That's what yeah. happens. That's human yeah. nature. Yeah. So human nature is um, the next person will come along and say, well, I've only got six months to live, so yeah. this law discriminates against me. Right. I've got 12 months to live, this law discriminates mm. against me. Mm. And, and it just opens that door up more and more. And right. So in Belgium, I think they went from about four people applied a month to now it's 40. Right. Uh, they, the youngest person to apply was 11 years old. Yeah. So. And then what happens when it expands like that, then also it becomes basically um, suicide by choice. Yeah. But then the pressure comes on people to actually end their lives. So right. elder abuse is in New Zealand. We know that. We've had court cases about it. Right. So elderly people will be pressured by greedy, selfish family members mm -hmm. to end their life. Mm -hmm. And also the disabled will be the other victims yeah. of this. Yeah. Because someone who's disabled that's reliant on caregivers, they get older, their caregivers are getting older. And the pressure will be on them, hey, look, you know, you've had a good run. Look how hard it is on mum and dad. They're trying to look after you. They're getting old. They're struggling. Actually, the fairest thing for you to do is actually end your life. Right. And so this law will see innocent people die. Yeah. So the question is, I guess it's that line between safety and freedom. Yeah. When it, what law is actually, although it will give these people choice and freedom to choose, it will actually mean these people die early. Right. And so for us, we say, well, as a nation... Is that really where we want to go? Right. And, and we don't believe it is because the innocent should be protected and the vulnerable. And also funding, you know, government's limited funding. What are they going to fund? Hospices and good palliative care or, or a concoction of drugs, which is so much cheaper just to end your life. Right. So to us personally, it's uh, going down the wrong path for a caring right. nation. Right. So let's talk about uh, cannabis. Uh, yeah. I think these three, uh, euthanasia, cannabis and abortion, uh, they have actually... Uh, split the uh, people who would generally vote for Labour. I know personally a lot of Indians and uh, Samoans and you know uh, Pacifica people who 
uh, although they agree with some of the economic policies of Labour yeah. and the Greens, uh, actually are completely opposed to this. Yeah. So what about cannabis? Should it be made legal? So medicinal cannabis is legal. In yeah. fact, the biggest hemp farm in New Zealand just got uh, permission to start. I think it was just last week in Nelson. Yeah. So, you know, you got to take that out. It's not about medicinal cannabis. Yeah. And it's not about um, stopping people that smoke a joint getting locked up. Right. I don't think there's anyone in New Zealand that's locked up for just yeah. smoking Small a joint. joint yeah. Okay? This is about legalising uh, psychoactive drugs in New Zealand. Yeah. That's what it's about. Yeah. And the, the, for those of us who have worked with that risk youth and young people that have been... And those of us that employ us, the risks are we will see the detriment of young people because when they hear this legalised, they'll go, this drug is okay yeah, now because yeah. the government has legalised it. Right. So big businesses are ramping up yeah. in case it gets legalised, yeah. so they know they're going to sell more. Yeah. Really, we're sacrificing our young people for big business to make money. That's the bottom line on it. And it will cost us. It will cost us in mental health and accidents and workplace accidents uh, and, and loss of drive. Do you reckon that legalising cannabis will actually or drive up the black market? Because people may want stronger cannabis, or they may want cheaper cannabis, or they may want. Well, so what, what happens? And, yeah. I, and I, you know, I haven't got the actual evidence in front of me for this, yeah. but say you had this patch of grass was your cannabis crop. Yeah. You could sell half of that legally through your shop. Yeah. The other half you can sell on the black market cheaper yeah. because you're not paying tax on it. That's right. But then you can actually sell other drugs as well and launder that money because you've got to prove that you've sold all that cannabis. Right. So there's just a whole lot of things. The way, what we're saying though is. We want to legalise a product that actually destroys people's drive and brain, and that's mm. not good. I don't think that's good governance. Right. The real issue is why do people feel they have to take drugs? That's the real bottom line. Right. Why do people feel they have to escape life? Right. And what we need to do as a society is make it life so good they don't want to escape it. Yeah. You know, rather than just giving these tools to escape it, which destroys them. Right. Finally, let's talk about uh, gender ideology. That's one of your uh, key policies. Well, I think the reality is there's a very, very small number of New Zealanders have any form of gender dysphoria, mm -hmm. right? And those that do, 90% of them, by the time they finish puberty, they're quite happy with how they're born. Yeah. So we're talking of tiny portion of But what we're doing now is we're telling all our young people yeah. that actually you can choose whether you're a boy or a girl. Right. And what my, many parents may not understand is that yeah. there's a ballot in the, in the um, box mm. that if that gets drawn out and approved, yeah. would make it an offence for you as a parent to say to your child, no, you are a boy and you're not going to be a girl. You're only five years old, you are a boy. Oh my, okay. You would be penalised for it. So, so, so someone has put them... Uh, that, is in the, that is in the ballot. It's a private member bowl in the ballot box so no mm. you're the parent mm. you get to choose mm. as an adult yeah if they choose as an adult they want to change their sex right that is up to them they're right. an adult they right. choose but we said they should pay for it as well but yeah. we do not believe school should be telling four five six year olds that they should change the gender that right. they're not a boy or a girl on a sliding scale because it just takes it puts more stress on them right they, you know they're, they're just children yeah let them be children yeah as an adult, if they want to make that decision, that is their choice to make, yeah. but not as a child. If they introduce something a little bit and a little bit, and they introduce it and pull it back and introduce it, and, and they're trying to change, break down the moral culture of New Zealand. But yeah. the trouble is, I don't know if you know, but um, I think it was just last week, some professor overseas came yeah. out and said, pedophilia should be part of your gender choice. Yeah, I, 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 I saw that. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, what's next, bestiality? Because yeah. what they're saying is, if you want to do something, you should be able to do it. That, yeah. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Anything you want should do. but. The um, Dunedin Longitudinal Study, yeah. uh, you know, it was at a thousand people over about 40 years. Yeah. I think one of the things they came out with was actually one of the keys to know whether you succeed or fail is actually self-control. Right. So we shouldn't be telling people, you can, if you feel like it, you do it. Mm. We should be saying, well, what's the long-term result of this? Right. What does that look like for a society long-term if you go down that path? Right. What's happened to previous societies yeah. where they've gone down that path? Yeah. And for me personally, the societies that have worked best is where we've had a strong family unit yeah. with a mum and a dad in a loving relationship. Yeah. It's a safe place for kids to grow up. Right. They can they can go out, they can try things, they can make mistakes. Yeah. There's somewhere safe for them to come back. They'll always have somewhere to stay. There'll always be a meal for them. It gives them that security and that safety. And what we're doing is we're destroying that for young people. And then we're going, oh my goodness, we have high teenage suicide rates. Mm. Oh my goodness, we have massive young people with depression, yeah. high mental illness rates. Why has that happened? Because we've destroyed the actual foundation for them. Right. And I guess it's a bit of what I saw when my family broke up. The mm. foundation went from under me. Mm. You know, I had mum and dad and all of a sudden it was broken. And mm. what did I see myself? I responded poorly to that. Yeah. So part of our, our justice policy is actually yeah. teaching people what a good relationship is. Right and how to build, develop, and maintain healthy relationships, because that is a skill we all need. Right, I think uh, talking about justice policy, you also have some ideas about uh, prisons, isn't it? That mm. you, you have the three strikes uh, policy and... Well, not so much, we, we call it three-stage sentencing. So uh, three-stage sentencing, So yeah. what, 
what we're looking at is, okay, yeah. people, we'd, we'd like to divert people as much as we can from a life of crime. So yeah. relationship training, trade training from year nine, yeah. youth farms are all about diverting people from crime. But those people that find themselves incarcerated, we reckon put them through three stages. Mm. So it's a pathway for every offender to be released. Right. The first step is they get involved in work in prison, mm -hmm. whether it's in the kitchen or the laundry or cleaning or building traps for going out in the bush, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Once they're doing that, the second stage is every offender gets an individualised education program. Right. And why that's important is so many of our offenders are fetal alcohol syndrome, very poor numeracy and literacy. Mm -hmm. So for some of them, it may just be basic numeracy and literacy. Yeah. But for others, it might be a degree or a diploma or you know, really smart ones might be a tradesperson. <laughs> but, but what you're really doing is you're putting a target yeah. that they must achieve. Yeah. No one else can achieve it for right. them. They must achieve. And so once they've achieved that, they've tasted success, they've met a target, yeah. then it's work to release. And that's done a little bit in New Zealand, but we'd like to make that a pathway for offenders. Right. And, and obviously, if they haven't achieved, they don't move to the next path. They don't yeah. move to the next path. They don't get out. They, but that's their choice. Yeah. Okay. And the last uh, work to release is when you're working outside of prison during yeah, the day. Yeah. So you're, you're rubbing shoulders with people that aren't yeah, incarcerated. Yeah, yeah. You're hearing, oh, this person's playing sport, this yeah. person's taking his kids somewhere, yeah, these yeah. people are planning a holiday, yeah. that guy's bragging about how much fish he caught. Yeah. It's aspirational, it's inspirational. Yeah. They're making relationships outside of prison. Right. They're learning how to budget their finance. They're getting work skills. And what you're really doing is you're making the transition from being incarcerated to being free, just a small right. step, rather right. than what it is now, which is a, a big step, yeah. which so many of them struggle with. Right. Well, uh, uh, Leighton, uh, it looks like, uh, you know, looking at the momentum that your party is yeah. getting and, you know, the way you've worked so hard, you know, we see you on social media three times a day yeah. and not only you, but even your other colleagues. Uh, it looks like, you know, there's a very good chance that you will be in Parliament. If you are in Parliament, what are some of the first things that you would like to change? Uh, look, we, we see we'd like to re repeal the abortion law. We mm. think that needs to go to New Zealanders to decide. Yeah, yeah. And we need to tell them the truth about what they're deciding on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we really want to have binding referenda. Right. The reason for that is we want to give the power back to the people. Yeah. So, you know, you may disagree with our policies, yeah. but at least we're saying you can choose. Right. And democracy is meant about freedom of speech right. and the ability for us to debate and discuss, disagree, argue, right. come to a solution. Yeah. We're losing that in New Zealand. Right. Uh, we have people that are controlling what we hear, mm. controlling our speech, mm. controlling what goes up on social media. Yeah. That means they're controlling the discussion. That yeah. means they're limiting our choice. Right. That has got to go. Yeah. And, uh, and we would probably team up with parties that have a similar view. Right. <laughs> Leighton, I think it was wonderful talking to you. Uh, you have really been very clear about your policies and I think uh, when our viewers see this, uh, they, a lot of what you said will resonate at, especially with our viewership. So thank you so much for coming on the show and for sharing your views and your opinions and being so open about uh, all your policies. It was wonderful talking to you. Fantastic. Yeah, Thanks so much yeah. for having us on. We really appreciate it. You're welcome.